Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks Wendy for inviting me. Uh, thanks you all for coming out. Um, I'm not going to talk for long because I know you all want to go and try out uh, token card in the pub, so I'll keep it short. <laughs> so I uh, just need to talk a just mention what I'm, uh, who I am. Uh, I run a consultancy uh, in Oxford called Extropy. We do uh, blockchain development, uh, security audits, etc. Uh, what might be more interesting for you is that uh, we also, along with a partner, run a number of workshops for developers. Um, so pretty much every weekend now we're, we're running some workshops. Uh, and if, certainly if you're interested in zero knowledge proofs, we did a, a zero knowledge proof workshop uh, last weekend. Um, and we plan to hold these uh, pretty much every month. So if you're interested in any of those, they're all free. I know some of you in the audience have already been to some of them. Uh, so just uh, get in touch with me or uh, check out the website and, and sign up for those. Okay, that's enough about me. So um, this is a talk about a consensus mechanism, and it was developed uh, along with this company, Zane. I was working for them. Uh, they're a Berlin startup, um, so I've worked, I worked with them for a couple of years. So this is not new, I'm afraid, but um, because uh, the, the last meetup you had uh, Silvio Micali from Algorand talking about uh, how Algorand works, and because this consensus mechan borrow mechanism borrows a lot from Algorand, I thought it might be interesting for you to see uh, what we have done with it. So we, we wrote a paper about this. If you're interested, you can uh, look it up. Uh, it's on the, the Royal Society uh, Open Science website. Um, so it started off because uh, the, the CEO of Xane, he was he very much in, in favor of uh, proof of work. Um, but one of the problems uh, that uh, people uh, have with it, uh, especially because we were looking at the time at uh, small devices that we wanted to run nodes on, uh, one of the problems with uh, proof of work is it's that uh, the amount of energy, I mean, here's the maybe slightly out of date now. I think this was true a few weeks ago, but the Bitcoin network was taking the same amount of energy as uh, used by Uzbekistan. Um, so we're looking at how could we, could we develop a different mechanism that uh, would use less energy uh, because we were targeting small devices. We were targeting devices to put into vehicles. So we were trying to find something that would use less energy. And we came up with uh, this thing called proof of kernel work. Uh, I don't know where the name came from exactly. It was the CEO who thought of that. But it had to be called proof of something. And then well, the rest of it followed. And we came up with a two-stage uh, mechanism. Um, and I should point out this is really, this was for private networks. This is not for a public network. This is for private networks on Ethereum. And it's a two-stage uh, mechanism. We start off with a whitelist of nodes who are interested in mining. And from that, we select a committee. And then from the committee, we then select a winner who will produce the next block. The selection of the committee is done via cryptographic sortition, which is uh, the part we got from Algorand. The selection of the winner from that committee is then just basic proof of work. So quite, quite a simple idea. The cryptographic sortition, uh, the features you need for that is that the nodes need to know themselves uh, whether they have been selected on, for the committee. So this runs for, for every block. There's a new selection of a committee. So the nodes need to be able to determine themselves whether they have been selected. And then the other nodes in the network, when they're verifying the blocks, need to be able to verify that the, the, uh, the miner that produced the block was actually on the committee. Uh, and this also then involves some kind of identity. So we need some private keys involved here or some identifier for the, the nodes. Uh, this is based on uh, some uh, work, uh, again, we, we got this from Algorand, uh, verifiable random functions, uh, nice, nice things, um, where you take a key, a secret key, and a seed, uh, put it through your function, and it gives you some random output, but also a proof of that output. And then other, other nodes can take the random output and the proof, and the, the public key corresponding to the secret key, check that, and decide whether that was actually uh, the, the correct output uh, from the function. So, okay, quite straightforward. This is what's used by Algorand. So their, their uh, algorithm uh, for, for doing sortition uh, is this. Uh, so quite complex, but they take the, there you go, the seed uh, and then the role also and, and the secret key. So the role is because they, they permission things differently um, and produce a hash. This is the random output and a proof. They then also uh, weight uh, the, the, uh, the chance of getting into the committee is also weighted to do with the number of uh, tokens you own. I know when, uh, the, the, from the talk the last uh, meetup, people, some people didn't kind of like this idea and uh, wanted more the idea of kind of one 
account, one vote or something. Um, but it's quite difficult to, to do this in a way that is civil attack resistant. Anyway, so this is the, uh, the algorithm for, from Algorand. So and this is much more complex than the one uh, that we went with. Um, this is, is, is a slide that, that Xane produced to, to explain what we were doing. Um, there's a slight mistake on it. This is not quite true here, but um, I think the basic idea is fairly easy to, to follow. So we're producing blocks. Each block has a seed. We produce this, uh, this function uh, and, and do the sortition. And there is a mixture of some public, some public information uh, and some private information. So you're getting private keys from the, the various nodes here mixed with the public information of the block seed. And from that, we can do the sortition function to decide whether each one of these nodes will be selected to be on the committee. So we've colored the ones green here that were selected, and the one in sort of purple has not been selected. And then we go to the, the next block, and we just repeat the same, repeat the same process. Uh, the actual um, formula we use, um, and there, there are various uh, options for this. What we have done, we, we take this seed uh, from the previous block, so R here represents the block height. Um, and then from that, we can, you can do it in two ways. You can either sign that to get your seed for the current block. Um, the other thing you could do is to just do a hash here. If you're doing a hash, that's quite nice because it makes it deterministic. So if you imagine you're a node uh, using this, uh, this protocol, uh, what you could do is you could uh, work out uh, going forward uh, just by hashing, uh, going through hashing the seeds repeatedly, you could work out for the next, say, 1,000 blocks uh, what the seeds are going to be. And then you could work out, using your own private key, whether you will be selected for the committee. And if you're not going to be selected for another 500 blocks, say, then you could go offline and then, and then come back when you are going to be selected and take part. Um, if you do it by signing, that makes it perhaps a little bit harder to attack. So a malicious attacker would have to... Uh, would not know in advance uh, what the, the seeds are going to be. Then the actual sortition itself is it's quite simple, really. N here represents a target committee size. And this is the, the total number of uh, nodes that are in the whitelist. So we're just taking a percentage of the whitelist size and saying we're going to have that. Um, that's going to be our threshold. Um, so say you've got uh, 16 nodes all together on your whitelist. Uh, and you uh, want to target a committee size of eight, then you want, uh, you're want you going to get 50% here. And then we take the seed for this block, uh, the block height. Uh, take six, we just sign that with our private key, so that's where our private information comes in. And then we apply a hash function to that, and then normalize this between 0 and 1, and then test that against the threshold. So that's, I think that's quite, quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, and it means this, then that, yeah, that just tells you, uh, if you if you're lower than that amount, then you're a member of the committee. And you can then go and do the proof of work and produce the next block. Is that all OK? Yeah. Okay. Uh, other other uh, blockchains have done it differently. Uh, similar things, but say Witnet, they've done it. Uh, they, here, they have uh, kind of a reputation uh, function involved as well. But a, a similar kind of thing. I think this is a. Sortition is quite a generally useful uh, piece of cryptography, so other people have used it. Um, nice things about this, the, the, in terms of scalability, um, we're always talking about a percentage of the whitelist size, so you can adjust this. And if you have suddenly you want to increase the number of nodes in your, your network, you can still keep the committee size the same size, if you like, or you, you can adjust it how you like. Um, and the, the actual time to reach consensus does not, uh, is not influenced by uh, the committee size, really. It's just the difficulty of the proof of work. Um, and that, so the committee size doesn't affect the total amount of energy we're, we're going to be using. Uh, sorry, it does increase the total amount of energy, but that doesn't increase the consensus time. Sorry. Uh, finality, well, we're still using proof of work, so the, the same rules apply. So reorganizations of the chain can occur. Um, but if you're thinking about security, although those, you can get reorganizations, you could start mining your own blocks, but you still have to take into account the committee membership if you're doing that. So it's not just a question of solving proof of work. You also have to do the committee membership part as well. So the security of this, uh, this effectively gives you increased security uh, for a uh, 
small committee size. So you're getting this kind of security of the whole this, uh, whitelist, but uh, you're actually only doing proof of work on, on the, the nodes that are in the committee. So you're getting more security for, for less energy uh, from this. Um, if you're wanting to attack this, you would need to try to figure out what, which nodes, you know, you're going to copt certain nodes, you're going to have to figure out which nodes are going to be on the committee for which blocks. Uh, so it makes the, a malicious attacker's job quite a bit harder. Um, the original design we had for this was a little bit more complex. So we initially had some anomaly detection as well. So we had the idea of adding some AI uh, into this. So there would be a, uh, a neural network would have been trained to look for anomalies, and that will be running on a node, and that would be checking the network for anomalies, so for malicious behavior, and also for things like the, the, uh, the difficulty of proof of work. So if we needed to increase or decrease that, and that could then uh, interact with the, uh, the parameters of the blockchain to, to change that, to either you know, increase the difficulty, say, or if you found there was some malicious behavior going on, you could eventually throw people out to the whitelist. So our original design had this, and also this anomaly detection followed a similar pattern. So the node chosen to do the anomaly detection would be chosen as uh, following the same process. Um, we, did, we started to do this, uh, and then um, it got quite complex because you have to kind of synchronize the, kind of the two processes a bit. And also, the clients we were talking to uh, really just wanted this, this simple version and weren't really interested in the AR part as well. So that got, you know, got put on hold. Um, you probably have thought of some problems about this. I'll mention a couple, um, <laughs> but then, um, you can come up with some more. Uh, one that we see, uh, it's possible to get a committee size of zero. So if you only have a few nodes in your network, it's possible that the, the, the cryptographic sortition will come back and none of the, the nodes will have been selected for the committee, at which point your network just stops. Um, you can't proceed, you can't produce a new block, you can produce a new seed, so that's it. Uh, and that is quite a problem. Yeah. <laughs> No, and I mean, does, if you have, you, we did we did have a client who just wanted 100% of their nodes involved in the committee each time. Yeah. 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 You could have larger than the target size. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, committee size is a problem. Um, also, there's the, the problem that um, we were looking at this on private networks, and look particularly with consortia who may be running their own servers, they'll be running their own nodes, each of which will have uh, a hash, certain hashing power, and they probably are thinking that everybody's hashing power is roughly equivalent for doing the proof of work. But somebody, if they're malicious, could actually farm out the proof of work to some server that's got a lot of hashing power, and then if they're selected onto the committee, they can pretty much guarantee every time they're going to win the proof of work. Race. So that is another potential problem. Um, whitelist governance as well. We just took a very simple thing that, to start with, where if you're on the whitelist, you can then add other nodes. Um, we started looking at how to set up layers of nodes and um, allow some kind of voting, uh, sort of maybe using quadratic voting, so that people could form a consensus on which nodes may be malicious and then throw them off after a certain time. But that gets quite, quite, gets quite complicated eventually. Um, the other the ideas we had as well was, um, instead of using proof of work, we, we thought about using maybe proof of elapsed time. We could use some trusted hardware with that. Um, you could also use proof of authority. So you could just select your committee and then just, uh, say, take it in turns uh, to, to mine a block, and then you're not using any energy. You have the problem there with liveness, I guess, because you, you're not necessarily guaranteed that the um, people are going to be selected onto the committee or uh, the ones that are going to be doing it next. So. At least with proof of work, you know that they are actually getting involved. But whatever, this was, you know, these are all options for the future. Uh, so our initial client, we took a, a fork of uh, Geth uh, in November 2017, just after the, there was a hard fork. Uh, we added this consensus mechanism in. We reduced the the size of the DAG down to 64 megs because we were we were targeting small devices. So this was particularly. We were looking at putting these on Raspberry Pis. We put it on a Pi 3, we then put it on a Pi 0. We were trying to move it down onto to microcontrollers as well. So we really needed to reduce the, uh, the memory footprint that was needed. And another problem we had was that 
because this is, a, this is on a private network, um, and on a, on a public network, you get uh, the miner of a block will put their address in the block because they're expecting a block, re block reward, and they're not going to put somebody else's address in there, otherwise they will lose out. On a private network, and in, in this case where it's permissioned, um, you could have a, someone producing a block who is not on the whitelist or not on the committee, putting somebody else's address into the block and pretending that they produce the block and then get a block getting accepted. So we had to change the block header and actually get the miners to sign the blocks before they were sent out so that we could prove that the, the, miner, the correct miner did actually produce the block. Um, a little bit of benchmarking we did recently, uh, not many nodes and a small committee size. We, we started um, about a fairly average amount. This is on a private network. Got up to about 600 transactions per second at one point. Then we had another client who was running this and increased the block size, got it over 1,000 transactions per second. So it, we, it increased reasonably. Um, it was really just a question of lowering the difficulty. So we got the difficulty. As we reduce the difficulty, obviously, the block time drops. So we were doing it about you know, one second, maybe. But then you get the problem of getting lots of uncles because of the network latency. So a sort of happy medium was about three to five seconds for a block time. Uh, and then it was just a question of increasing the block size just to get more transactions in, um, which, which worked reasonably well. I think our signing mechanism took too long, and that was slowing things down as well. So we, we need to work on that. All of this is open source, so the, the paper has been published uh, describing the algorithm. Um, that geth version is uh, also open source now. Um, I'm starting work on a parity implementation, so I'm just going to do work version in Rust um, instead. But yeah, it's all open source if you want to try it out, get involved with it. Um, future, yeah, we'll try parity version. Maybe we'll try and introduce this anomaly detection again. Um, Although it gets quite complex, there's quite a lot involved there. Um, we thought about doing some, yeah, using zero knowledge because um, this, this act of signing and doing all the validation can get quite intensive. And so if you're ending up with a, a large blockchain, it may be advantageous to, to, rather than having to repeat this computation, you can do something to, that, similar to what Coder are doing, uh, where you're, they're using uh, recursive snarks to validate blockchains very, very quickly. So we may try to do something with that just to cut down on the time uh, that we, we need to take in, in all of our uh, verification. OK, uh, that's the end of my talk. There's my contact details there. If you want to uh, get in touch, ask more questions, or you can ask questions now. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Confused because at the beginning there was like this, you know, Bitcoin has this energy problem of proof of work yeah. being a public network, and then you're saying that this is only applicable to private networks. Why is it not applicable to public networks? Just so this, this we wrote this for private networks, and I, I don't. I mean, we can't really whitelist things very easily on a, a public permissionless network. So, no, so you, can't your outside circle just be everyone? You have to uh, have this. Yeah, if you you could have everyone, but then you get the if if someone's malicious, then how do you how do you get rid of them trying to, to produce blocks or trying to yeah, join I mean, the committee? That's my problem with yeah. it. Is it actually doesn't seem to prevent. It doesn't seem to have a solution to malicious behavior. Because not not on public networks. No. On, like colluding nodes could have so like if someone is excluded from the committee, well they can just donate their um, hash power to a committee member who they're colluding with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it doesn't have a mechanism. So that's why I was saying we need to look at we need to get the governance working and look at the anomaly detection to, to do that so that you can stop people. So hopefully that will we would want in the anomaly detection to try to detect that behavior and try to work out if the same accounts they're all always producing the, the blocks then they, they, maybe you would try to lower their, their okay. reputation and things Just like that. Just to be yeah. clear, in this yeah. private network the nodes need to trust each other. So it's to some extent, yeah, uh, okay. yeah. Or you need some mechanism to try and enforce that, yeah. Have you got any enterprise level clients that are interested in testing? And yeah, so um, we do um, have a client who who use this and have built an application on top of this, and it's a consortium. I don't know if I can say who they are, but they're like yeah, the do. largest sh uh, largest shipping and haulage companies are using this for supply chain. So it's, it was, I think it was about to go in production soon. So hopefully, hopefully it will. Yeah. Go on, Sammy. So 
So we, we initially have a list of addresses in the Genesis block. And we have a smart contract in the Genesis block with, a, with some addresses in there. And that's the initial nodes that are on the whitelist. And then you need some sort of governance to then change that and add nodes in or out. Yeah, exactly. So when you set up the network, you, you, know, you create a Genesis block and you, you put the, the nodes that you want in there. Yeah. Go on. Go on. So how, how are we getting around some of the issues we identified and how are we creating things for the client? Uh, so yeah, we need, to, we need to develop this further. So you know, we produced this, this first version, which I think we're, the security bit wasn't great because it still does have some potential problems. And so we need to look more into the particular things like the governance and anomaly detection to, to get around this. Yeah. Sorry, you, you heard you had. Uh, yeah. 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 So I mean, it's, it's quite similar. This is just something we, you know, we wanted to to try this. It's it's relatively it's from quite a while ago, really. Um, we like proof of work, so I think we feel very secure about having that still in there. Um, and cryptographic sortition seems a very neat solution. So it seemed a good a good fit. Um, but yeah, we could you could put proof of authority in there. Um, but then you do get the problem, I guess, of, of the liveness that you may end up with. Um, you may end up choosing a, a node that's not actually going to do anything and, and produce the next block. Although we also have that problem with the zero committee size. So, yeah. yeah. <coughs> on, a, on a private network, yeah. what, what problem are you solving that you couldn't do with a SQL server cheaper and quicker? Um, so, the, where I've seen it used, now it's, sometimes I think it's perhaps. You overuse, but where I've seen it used, particularly with consortia, where they have some companies come together, they kind of they may be competitors, they want some to share some information, they don't really trust each other completely. So this is a way for them to do that. Uh, okay, this is a way for them to do that um, and to be confident in how the, the information, you know, whatever they're sharing, how they're going to be confident about that or how the, the transactions are, are verified. It doesn't always make sense. Particularly, we've had instances where this is between one company who decided to set up a network, and to me, that doesn't make so much sense. Although I also have known companies who don't trust their departments, so they effectively you've got a kind of consortium of departments, so they're all a little bit <coughs> distrusting each other. So, yeah, uh, I see what you mean. Yeah, right. Steve, go. I mean, have you invented the first pluggable consensus? Because the theory now has got this pluggable consensus mechanism. Yeah. So that once. Ethereum rolls forward, we could take yours and just plug it in. Yeah, so no, we haven't because we started this, you know, back in yeah, about 18 months ago before, I think. So. Is the intention to try and do that? Or? Yeah, if we can get, yeah, if we can get the yeah, funding to do it, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how, I mean, this is still, you know, we're still looking at proof. Of, I'm not sure how it's going to work with as Ethereum goes forward into, um, you know, 2.0 and things. I don't know. But I can try. Yeah. There's we also thought of proof of elapsed time as well. So yeah. Is there any advantage? I don't know. Um, it's not being used as possible. Doing a switch up mechanism, so you could switch the proof, randomize it or something, um, to stop someone coming in and just doing. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Uh, I guess uh, you might have. Yeah, I don't know how. Um, yeah, I like the idea. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah. So as Algorand, right, we're talking about permissionless stuff, and I, I don't understand any of this stuff, but you're building on work which they were doing on their selection mechanism. Is that something which is in your headspace? Are you thinking about permissionless systems? Uh, I'm just thinking about just private private chains. I, I, I mean, the, the guys at Ethereum are, you know, so much cleverer than me that I wouldn't want to, you know, even think about it. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're, they're doing it properly, yeah. Okay. Well, they're really good puns. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>